good evening. So today I will repeat a little bit of the last uh, talk. So, so at the very end of my last talk I have derived a sound equation, but I committed an error. <laughs> And uh, he was able to discover where was error. <laughs> the error was just a minus sign somewhere missing. So I remind you that the sound equation is just a wave equation in, in three space dimensions. And it was based on three uh, physical laws. First law is, I will write the... So the story was like that. At the very beginning we had a, um, the, the air in, in some equilibrium state which is characterized by uh, the density rho zero and p zero. And then we enter, we start uh, talking, and at each uh, place both rho zero and p zero change, and there are relations between them. This belongs to hydrodynamics. Um, so p, actual p, which will be a function of time and position, will change and it will be p0 plus some small change because we uh, developed the linear equation, which of course is only an approximation, but it seems that it is very good approximation. Whenever we talk about acoustics, those fellows who are uh, constructing philharmonies and so on, they don't go beyond linear approximation. It is far sufficient. Okay. <coughs> rho is equal always rho zero plus small variation. And uh, the thermody both thermodynamics and uh, um, hydromechanics give us the following result, which is that the small variation of the pressure is equal to, is proportional to small variation of rho and proportionality coefficient is, this is rigidity and this is rho zero, roughly speaking. And of course it is a first approximation be, because usually this law is no longer uh, linear. But for small variations from the equilibrium, now this age can be, we, we can go farther uh, and find the value of h from first principle, from thermodynamics and so on and so on, but I don't need it. So I remain on this purely phenomenological level. You may always say that this is a three-dimensional version of the Hooke law. Now, the Hooke law for one-dimensional medium was the change of the length of an elastic road is proportional, no, sorry, change of the uh, length is proportional to the force, force, and this is the proportionality coefficient, and, and so this is precisely the same, except that now all these forces are not per uh, length volu volume, but per, per volume, no, not per unit length, but per unit volume. But otherwise it is like that. So this may be called the three-dimensional version of the, of the Hooke law. 
Now, the second ingredient was the continuity equation that the matter is, not, is neither created or annihilated. Whenever rho changes, it means that this change is due to some flow. To some flow, therefore, it is equal. I uh, have written it in uh, integral version, but okay, you should know this is minus divergence of the uh, matter flow, and this matter flow is uh, nothing but uh, rho times velocity yeah i will put yeah which means that roughly speaking for small distortions yeah no so it is equal minus divergence of rho times v where V is the uh, fluid velocity. I say fluid because air is also a fluid. <laughs> it is a gas, but, but gas is also a fluid. And therefore, if we plug rho zero pl plus delta rho, so we will get minus divergence of rho zero, so I will put this rho zero outside of V, plus delta rho, but delta rho is already first order, is a small parameter, and velocity of course is also a first order parameter. Therefore, what would be there is of the second order. We throw it away, and to be honest, I will write down like that, okay? Which simply means that we remain on the level of the linear approximation. Second order quantities we throw away. Okay, so this is the uh, continuity of the matter, or conservation of, of matter. And the third law was Archimedes. Aha, by the way, by the way, when I evoked the analogy of that with uh, the Hooke's law, then observe that in an elastic material, the internal uh, stresses are not homogeneous. Yeah, therefore, to describe internal stresses in, uh, in an elastic material, we, you need much more complicated uh, picture, namely the stress tensor and so on and so on and so on. However, in a liquid, the stress is homogeneous. Therefore, it may be replaced by a, a scalar. This is due to which observation in the history of science? Pascal law. Pascal law tells you that the pressure acts equally in all the directions. This is the Pascal law. Therefore, we have used here also Pascal law. Okay. And the third is Archimedes. So, Archimedes. What is Archimedes equation? It is, it tells you that the force which acts on a small uh, three-dimensional volume, the force which acts from all the directions, so how the exterior acts on an interior, yeah? So it is, I have written gradient 
of uh, P and of course times the the volume and this was an error and he has found it because of course minus sign stands here because the force finally acts from places where the pressure is big to places where it is small and gradient goes towards uh, high pressure so and this uh, were, uh, is directed towards low pressure therefore minus here and this was precisely missing and now so this is Archimedes this is Archimedes force sorry And this is Newton. Newton. Newton, which tells you that if such a force acts on this small, tiny piece of of the liquid, then it is equal to the in quotation mark mass mass times uh, acceleration okay what is mass mass is simply uh, density times volume and acceleration is nothing but velocity dot yeah, and fortunately, the uh, delta v, which is an arbitrary element of this reasoning, because we have just chosen in our mind, doesn't enter into account. Therefore, when we drop this v, we see that minus gradient of p is equal to rho times v dot again rho is rho zero plus very small uh, distortion the, but velocity and acceleration are again we remain on the on a level of linear approximation therefore we drop out the second order uh, term and we remain on the level of first order of linear approximation yeah and now if we <coughs> so now we take the second uh, the time derivative of this equation so we get rho double dot equal okay now we upgrade this approximation to the level of <laughs> exact <laughs> equality because we remain on the level of this linear description is equal to what rho zero is rho zero it is just a constant therefore it we don't uh, so it is minus rho zero divergence of <coughs> v dot yeah of course the divergence contains space derivatives time derivative is another derivative and the derivatives of course uh, commute therefore I may enter with it and now we plug in what we have here therefore we must take a divergence of the, uh, both right hand sides so this minus kills this minus and this was my <laughs> my problem last time because I was looking where the hell the minus <laughs> was uh, lost it was lost here here 
I wrote this formula without minus, so, so no minus, and divergence of gradient is nothing but uh, is equal, yeah, row zero drops out, and we obtain equal uh, the divergence of the gradient is a Laplacian, yeah? Laplace operator. You know it. It is the sum of second derivatives, at least if we calculate it in a Cartesian coordinate, because otherwise we enter into differential geometry, but I'm not going into that. So if we use just... Okay, so this is what? Uh, Laplacian of P and Laplacian of P when it acts on P0 it is just a constant uh, pressure so it is only a Laplacian of this small tiny uh, distortion which is Laplacian of that. So, which is h over rho zero, Laplacian of rho, of, of the entire rho. Okay, so, so again we have this equation. Yeah which we have already studied oh, now. So H over rho zero Laplacian rho equal rho double dot. So I prefer to put this constant on the right hand side for Laplacian of rho equal I will write it like that h over rho zero you remember that it is precisely the same coefficient uh, which arises in one dimensional case namely in string equations, yeah? It was h, a different h, because this was a, just a one-dimensional uh, hook, co no, uh, how do you call this coefficient? L I forgot, L it is not called hook coefficient, but, okay. And, and here it was also a, the, the, Mm. row uh, times row double dot uh, dot is always d over dt yeah so this is a second derivative over dt square and now a mathematician doesn't like to have such coefficients, therefore he uh, replaces it by c square, which simply means that c is defined as h over rho zero square root, and then this c square will be married with t, therefore it is uh, sorry, but of course, rho, yeah. So, so it is equal d2 over d tau, where tau is nothing but ct. It turns out that this c is nothing but the sound velocity. It is just a velocity, we are going to study it carefully. Now I only announce it. This constant c, defined this way, it is just a velocity with which the 
uh, sound waves propagate. And sorry, this is two. Yeah, because this is c squared times c squared. So it is very useful to introduce this new variable, which I call tau, in order to have this uh, operator d2 over dx dot plus d2 over dy dot plus d2 over dz dot, this is the Laplacian, minus d2 over d tau dot, and this operator acts on rho equals zero, and now we are going to discuss mathematical behavior of solutions of this equation. This is called a uh, wave equation. By the way, previously we studied the so-called string equation, which was the same equation by, but in two space uh, time or one space like coordinates, which means that we consider functions which do not depend upon z and, no, sorry, upon z, uh, y and z. So this was the string equation where everything depends only upon, uh, and this is the same equation in three dimensions and now uh, a pretty big part of my talk will will be concerned in discussing properties of this equations or, if you wish, properties of this second order differential operator, which very often the physicists call it like that. This was an invention of Einstein. Einstein has invented this notation because he told us that this roughly speaking like, like a Laplacian in four dimensions, except that this there is minus here. <laughs> because of course the, the, this would be the Laplacian in, in four dimensions. But okay, in physics we are doing so I also have a tendency to to use this um, notation for this operator in two space-like dimensions, which of course is stupid because the fundamental idea of Einstein was that four for two four dimensions. But the number of the dimensions doesn't matter too much. It matters, of course, I will discuss this, but the, the fundamental thing is that there are all pluses except one. This is fundamental. This operator is called hyperbolic operator by the analogy with the uh, equation of a, of a hyperboloid. Okay. So now let us so let us switch to mathematics. Uh, so I am going to discuss and I will begin with the with string equation because it is simpler. Okay, so so d two over d x square minus d two over d tau square. And phi is equal zero. And we are going to discuss the properties of solutions, how many of them, and so on and so on. Um, so the oh. 
I have also a tendency to tell my students or collaborators that this is the matter of uh, all hyperbolic equations. Whenever you want, you have some idea about how, for instance, the gravitational waves behave, go back to the string equation because of course, numerically, mathematically, it is not the same, but qualitatively, qualitatively, it is the same. So this is a very important example of a hyperbolic equation. To study how many solutions there are, it is useful to use the following trick. Namely, to use different coordinates, namely u, which is x minus t, and v, which is x plus t. This is just the change of, of coordinates, and it will be easier to solve this equation in these coordinates. And now, d over dt, by the way, those of you who have some small training in differential geometry know that this is nothing but by a vector, and this vector may be expanded in a new basis, namely d over du and d over dv. And now what are those Every vector may be expanded in d over dt and d over dx basis, but also in another basis. What are those coefficients? What have I to put here in order to get the derivative over dt? Of course, du over dt. And here, dv over dt. OK? Am I right? right? You may consider this identity as a theorem about uh, <coughs> derivatives of the uh, composed function, functions, because it is a composition. Yeah? First, a function is supposed to depend upon u and v, and those u and v depend upon t, and, and so on and so on. But I prefer to consider it as a just pure, pure algebra. You expand this. OK, now, what is du over dt? du over dt is minus 1, right? So it is minus d over du, and dv over dt is plus 1, plus d over no. uh, over dv. And the same with that. Again, I expand this in terms of the new basis. And what have I? I have a question. So this uh, dou by dou u is like a chart, uh, chart induced basis? You see, in differential geometry, d over d something is a vector. This is the best definition of a vector. And uh, if you, no, I, I don't know what, what to answer you. I, this formula should be obvious for everybody. Now you may interpret it as a Compo composed differentiation, then f you first differentiate over u and v, and next I differentiate them over t. 
But also you may interpret it in a geometric way, that d over dt, d over dv, uh, sorry, dx, is a basis. Sometimes this is called a t, and this is called, uh, called e x. But also d over d u, d over d v is another basis. And now, what is the relation when you have two bases e uh, in two-dimensional plane? Then, of course, you may expand one of them in terms of the other ones. And this is, this. no. Okay. In any case, I am, I try to use this notation because it is very, so what are those expansion coefficients? Of course, this is du over dx, and this is dv over dx. And I think that nobody of you is going to protest. This is true. And both du over dx and dv over dx is just one. Therefore, it is d over du plus d over dv. Therefore, our, our wave operator is equal to twice this operator d over dx, so it is d over du plus d over dv square, right? Square of operators. We first apply this operator and then again we apply this operator, right? And then minus Ah, oh, sorry, excuse me. I <laughs> promised to you this tau. The difference between tau and t is t. Of course, being a mathematician, a mathematician, one has a tendency to forget about this c. But sometimes, I, and of course, I have forgotten, and here I have put T, please forgive me, okay? So there should be tau here. Minus d over du minus d over dv. I have changed sign, but under the square, it is nothing. And now, what is the result? Square is square. Square is square of the first, square of the second, and then d over du times d over dv, or vice versa. But they commute because the second derivatives are symmetric. Therefore, second derivatives with respect to u, but it will be cancelled by second derivatives of that. Second derivative with respect to v will be cancelled by second derivatives of that. What remains is this twice the mixed derivative minus minus. Therefore, at the very end, we will get four times second mixed derivatives du dv. Okay? And it is much easier to analyze. So this equation, so phi equals zero, is equivalent to d2 over du dv, phi equals zero. This is equivalent. Yeah? And this equation is very easy to solve because we'll just integrate both parts, right? So we understand 
that V is now cons considered as a function of U and V equals zero. So now we are going to solve this equation. <laughs> Namely, I will write it this way, d over du of d over dv phi of u and v equals zero. So there is a something which in principle depends upon two parameters, u and v. But the derivative with respect to u is equal to zero. What does it mean? That it doesn't depend upon u, which simply means that df over dv is nothing but a certain function, let me call alpha of v. <coughs> okay, so if I know the derivative, so let us integrate over v, yeah? So this simply means that phi of u v is equal alpha of v. However, at each point v, a different constant, because normally plus constant, yeah? If we integrate, then there is some constant. But this constant may depend upon, upon u, because we integrate it independently for each u separately. Therefore, this constant depend, depends upon u. Let me call this function, let me call f, and this call, uh, function, let me call g. Uh, sorry, I wanted to, uh, I am used to v is, yeah, let me call this g and this f of u. Excuse me, but I'm used to <laughs> such a notation that the probability that I will make errors is much smaller if I use this notation. <laughs> Therefore, our conclusion is that a function which fulfills the string equation is, is always of the uh, type. So phi, now let us, let us express everything in terms of time and position. Time, let me come back to this tau, x is equal f of u, and what was u was x minus tau plus g of x plus tau. So every solution of this equation is a, is a all the solutions are there. Now, of course, you may begin to ask some sophisticated mathematical questions of what 
uh, a kind of functions are there, continuous or no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to, uh, too much. <laughs> because if they are uh, smooth functions, then of course everything goes smoothly. But of course you may think that those functions are, are not smooth. For instance, they are very often L square functions in physics are, are important, which are not continuous. Then you, you can think, ah, but non-continuous function, how to uh, differentiate them? The answer is you differentiate them in the sense of distribution. And everything all goes perfectly. You know, this is only a shift. The function does not need to be uh, differentiable, maybe highly non-continuous. But you know what does it mean to shift it? You shift it uh, right-wise or left-wise, but you know how to shift a function. And it turns out that actually this formula is valid not only for smooth solutions, but for also for generalized solutions, including distributions and so on and so on. Therefore, I do not need to enter very deeply into this sophisticated mathematics. It is now I have the following questions. During the first three lectures, I was always too late with beginning, and therefore I was trying to convince you that it is better not to make any any break. Now what do you prefer? Make the break now and then continue or continue without the break? With the break is fine. What? With break. With break? Okay. So let us, but let us make slightly less than quarter of an hour. Ten minutes? Yes. Okay, ten minutes break. Okay, so we begin the second part of this talk. So this formula admits a very general solutions of this equation. Solutions which are distributions or And now I am going to, uh -huh. first of all, what does it mean? Suppose g is equal to zero. If g is equal to zero, it simply means that the time evolution of this f is simply a transition. Yeah? There is some profile of, of a wave, wave which travels in this direction without any change. Yeah? We may call such solutions a right mover. Yeah? You may choose any profile, and then the time evolution means that this profile with velocity 1, when we measure time in meters, otherwise we have to put ct there, therefore then of course the velocity will be c. Yeah, so now you see that this constant c which I have introduced there is simply the velocity of those elastic waves in the in string equation, but of course it also applies to three dimensions, to the sound. If you suppose that the uh, wave 
does not depend upon two parameters, namely upon y and z, and only upon x. Therefore, it simply follows this uh, equation, because the derivative with respect y, uh, to y and z drop out, and everything behaves like in, in the string equation. Therefore, you see that this constant c is nothing but the velocity of elastic uh, waves in an elastic road or velocity of plain sound, sound waves in the air. <coughs> Okay, but this was only for interpretation, but now I am going to keep always this tau be, because it is much, the formulae are much easier to think. And now, and now I would like to make some exercise, which is very important one. And the exercise which leads to the notion of Lorentz transformations. This exercise was done around, I don't remember dates, but around 1880. I believe six or something like that, so a couple of years before Lorentz, but maybe somebody else did it, because this wave equation, which by the way is called d'Alembert equation, the or wave equation in 18th century, no, but rather in 19 and the first half of uh, 19, no, in 18 and the first half of the 19th century, physics was very much dominated by French people. Later on it changed and uh, later on there were mostly Germans up to 33, uh, mostly Germans. Physics was an exclusively German science up to Hitler. Then all those great people emigrated to America and it became mostly British and American subject. But in any case, around 88, a mathematician called Vogel, which means in German bird, bird, did an exercise which is similar to what we are going there, and um, he discovered the transformations which were later called Lorentz transformations, and some people say that they are the very essence of relativity. I don't think so. It is very essence. Very essence of relativity is just this structure which we are going to discuss. But in any case, Lorentz, uh, Lorentz transformations are very important. Let us discover them right now as symmetries of the, of the wave equations. Therefore, we know wave equations is d square over dx square minus d square over d tau square. This is the d'Alembert operator of, or wave operators, and we are asking ourselves what are symmetries of these operators. Suppose we pass to new coordinates. Yeah, tau, let me follow my notes because this way the probability of making errors will be smaller.
Yeah, okay. So let us choose new coordinates, tau uh, tilde and x tilde, which depend in a linear way. Of course, if uh, they depend in a nonlinear way, then the whole structure of linear equation will be destroyed. So let us suppose that they depend linearly upon <coughs> this Uh, the old coordinates, namely a tau plus b x and some c tau plus d x. And the question is, when the operator this wave operator will have the same, will look in the same way with respect to those new coordinates like it was in case of the old coordinates. Oh, so it is very easy. Again, we repeat the same game which we did previously. So d over dt is nothing but d over d, sorry, not t, tau. It may be expanded with respect to d over d tau tilde plus d over dx tilde. And now d over dx, again we expand with respect to d over d tau tilde plus d over dx tilde. So what stands here? d tau tilde with respect to d tau. d tau tilde with respect to d tau is what? a. So it is a here. What shall we put here? It is dx tilde with respect to d tau. The x tilde with respect to tau is c. C. Correct? Now, what sense here? It is d tau tilde with respect to x. Tau tilde with respect to it is b. Here, d x tilde with respect to the x. So this is d. And now, this wave operator is d over d tau square, which is nothing but, no, 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 sorry, d over dx square first. So this is b, d over d tau plus d, d over d x. Uh, sorry, this is tau tilde. x tilde, the new coordinates are tilde. Or slightly tau tilde is slightly uh, <laughs> misleading back on a square. Minus d over d tau square, yeah? So a d over d tau tilde plus c d over d x tilde square. So we will. Everything is, is okay, yeah? Before we solve it, because the next step would be to calculate late the coefficients in the second co uh, derivatives and to ask that the coefficients 
with respect to tau tilde x tilde are the same as in the original version. One, the mixed coordinates enters with zero coefficients, otherwise with plus one. And so this is a simple exercise which we are going to do. But before, before we do it, so I, I will continue. At, at, the, at this moment, I will <coughs> drop it. And I would ask you, suppose that we first want to find the symmetries, not of this d'Alembert operator, but symmetries of the Laplacian. So suppose that instead of minus, we will have plus. Moreover, instead of variable tau, there will be some y variables. So suppose, yeah, so I make a break here and I will try to find the not symmetries of the D'Alembert operator, but symmetries of the you see, Laplace operator is extremely important in all statis, uh, statical theories, like electrostatics and so on and so on. So, yeah. so I first find uh, symmetries of the Laplace or Laplace operators. Yeah, so Laplace operators, again in two, di di uh, in two uh, dimensions. So d over dx square plus d over dy square. So what we would do? We would do the same, just replacing tau by y. Yeah, so d over dy is equal a d over dy tilde plus c d over dx tilde d over dx equal b d over dy tilde plus d d over dx tilde. And now this Laplacian is nothing but a plus d o sorry a d over dy tilde plus c d over dx tilde square plus b d over dy tilde plus d d over dx tilde square. Now we calculate them. So there will be some coefficient with the second derivative of y square. What will be this coefficient? a square plus b square. Do you see? So there will be a square plus b square d over dy tilde square, right? Then there will be second derivatives with respect to x tilde with coefficients, which coefficients? c square plus d square c square plus d square, d second derivative with respect to the new coordinate x. And finally, there will be a mixed, yeah? <coughs> so there will be two, but they are not the same 
So only two, not just four. <laughs> so there will be uh, so there will be a c plus b d second mixed derivative the x square d y square it doesn't matter which order do I use yeah and now we are asking when this is equal to uh, the sum d square over dy square plus d square over dx. Sorry, two is missing here. Yeah. Okay. So we are asking where in the in new coordinates we have the same expression for this operator. Ah. So this must be equal to one. This must be equal to 1, and this must be equal to 0. Yeah, this is the answer. And three equations for four parameters, so in principle, we are, going, we are able to uh, solve them and to uh, find all the four parameters as functions of a, a single parameter, yeah? Okay. Yeah, so let me consider the case where this transformation doesn't differ too much from the unit, which means that A and D are non-zero. So suppose first that this D and B are non-zero. So first suppose A is equal non-zero and D is non-zero. This is only to to have some input. If this is the case, then we immediately have yeah, uh, B is equal minus A C divided by D. Huh? And now we may plug everything here so I so a square plus b square is a square plus a square d square c square which is nothing but a square over d square, which we suppose that it, it is non-zero, and then there will be d square plus c square. But if this is 1, because it was our, our assumption, then it means that this is 1. Yeah? So we conclude that a square over d square must be 1. Uh, one which simply means that either a is equal d or a is minus d or yeah so first put d equal a if d equal a or no is equal if d equal yeah if d is equal a if d is equal a, then b is equal minus c, then b is equal minus c. And finally, we have almost everything provided we solve one of these equations. Yeah, so now we have everything was linear till now. And now we have 
the remaining equation, for instance, this one, which is linear, which we choose A and B, then we know also D and C and everything is, yeah? How an intelligent man or woman, an intelligent person, solves such an equation? If an intelligent person sees two numbers such that their, the sum of their squares is equal to one, then the answer is what? They are sine and cosine of something, yeah? And this is the solution. So the solution is the following, that which one is sine, which one cosine, of course it doesn't matter, but if we are near to zero, because of course if this uh, angle is uh, zero, then cosine is a, a with, is one and this is zero. So this is the identity. But near to identity deformation, so I prefer to put a equal cosine of some angle phi and b equal uh, sine. Of fine, yeah, and then of course we have also D and we have also C. So after all, we have that I will write it like that X uh, Y. tilde are equal to some matrix acting on x, y. So x, y is equal something and something. Um, so this is C. This is, yeah? No, 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 this is x, d, and this is, because tau is now replaced by y, c. And here is a and b, yeah? So we plug our result. So it is d is equal cosine phi, c, c was minus b, minus sine phi, here sine phi, cosine phi, acting on x, y. Okay, and you know this, this matrix. You know this matrix. Namely, it is uh, the uh, rotation. It is a rotation by the angle phi. If phi is zero, then this is zero, this is one, so this is unit matrix doesn't change the, the trivial rotation. Yeah? So we have proved but here I have solved only this first case. The second case would be where d is equal minus a, and you will see that uh, it will be rotation with inversion. Inversion. So I stop here. I would like to give you a homework. Continue this and discover that every solution is a superposition of a an inversion, 
but not a point inversion, because in two dimension, the point inver inversion is also a rotation by uh, 180 degrees, which means pi. But the uh, mirror, uh, the mirror uh, inversion. So every solution is a superposition of a mirror equation. For instance, x remains the same, but y uh, changes sign minus 1. OK, I stop here. Please make this, uh, this is a very nice very nice exercise. And let us come back to our uh, problem where we want to find symmetries not of a Laplacian but of a D'Alembertian. So it is different, yeah? So we continue, but I really wanted to make this break because I believe nobody is doing this exercise and the physicists who are doing those things uh, are talking stupid things. So now trained on this Euclidean uh, picture, we are better prepared for the pseudo-Euclidean picture. OK, so let us do it. So, I just wanted to ask a, a, a small question about that. Yeah. I mean, I want to just to circle back on the change of coordinates, because I don't really understand the reason why we're doing that specific change of coordinates. Like. Because it is linear. Any, okay, just because any of, change of coordinates is linear. Okay, just because linear assumption. Now, of course, I see. First of all, of course, nonlinear changes are, are very instructive and very important in general relativity. But in special relativity, this linear or affine structure is very important. But affine transformation of, this, of space time correspond to linear approximations of this uh, space of vectors. So we want to respect this linear structure. Okay. Another remark is that if we consider nonlinear changes, then in very small uh, regions of space-time, it can always be well approximated by linear transformations. Yeah. Okay. When we take a, a sphere, for instance, then for purposes of navigation, so of course, a linear change, changes of geographical coordinates is useless. But at each point of time, we may use a flat coordinates, which are which approximate very well, because. When I am sailing on a small sea, like Baltic or Aegean Sea, like the ancient Greeks were sailing, then they didn't pay very much attention to the fact that the level of the water is curved, because in small scale, everything is almost flat. Therefore, in small scale, every Nonlinear coordinates may be approximated by uh, nonlinear change of coordinates may be approximated. Okay, so what is that? What is the uh, coefficient with d over d t square? Huh. It will be b square minus a square, yeah? So here, this, uh, you better put instead of a, b, you have to put b, a. Because you, you, 
I have just used uh, something is wrong. I have used x square. Ah, ah, because this is d over. No, it is correct. No, wait a moment. Ah, this d d over d x is that. This is d over d x square. This is d two over d x square, and this is d I mean, over d. Previously, we uh, we got the solution a squared. I have changed the the order because I wanted to have x on the first. <laughs> I am almost convinced that there is no error here. If there is one, please forgive me. I believe that it is OK. I have changed the order because I have replaced tau by y, but then tau is before x, but I wanted to have x before y because, I don't know, it's just a convention. I prefer to put x, y, and not y, x. It's correct. It doesn't matter, but I want it to have it. Equally, 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 a. So, but d is not equal to a. We got actually a equal cosine, b equal sine. So in that case, e equal co D equal cosine. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Of course, there is an error. Here is an error. Excuse me, B A. Because Y, yes, 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 of course. Excuse me. I have changed the order here, but I didn't change order here. Excuse me. Now it, there is no error. You are right. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Now it is correct, yeah. Uh, it was stupid to change this order, but I was, I'm just used to the fact that x goes before y, but x, y, but it doesn't matter. No. Okay, so what we do now? So now the situation is the. Again, we have three equations for four parameters, however, slightly different. Uh, now, um, the uh, second derivative with x, x will be plus d squared minus c square d second derivative with respect to the new variable x and of course again we will have mixed co uh, mixed derivative twice and uh, here will be bd minus ac And the transformation, may be called symmetry of this equation, if this is again a second derivative with respect to x, therefore if this is equal 1, minus second derivative with respect to, to the new time, therefore this must be equal minus 1. And this must be equal to zero because in the original wave operator the mixed derivative does not appear. Right? Okay, so now we are going to solve this. So again, let us assume that D and A do not differ too much from 
uh, from one. If they do not differ too much, then of course d not equal zero, c is not uh, sorry, not uh, a is not equal zero. Therefore, similarly as in the previous case, we have B equal almost the same as before, AC over D. The only difference is that there is plus sign here and not minus. We plug it into here, but this must be equal to 1, uh, minus 1, therefore 1 is equal A square minus B square is equal a square plus a square c square over d square, which is a square over d square. And now it is d square plus, uh, the, sorry, Minus, minus, excuse me, minus c square. Now, this must be equal 1. Which means that, again, a square over d square must be equal 1. Now, again, So the, the situation is as before, that either A equal D or A equal minus D. And again, let us consider the first case when A is equal D, and the second case I will give you as a homework. <laughs> and of course, it will correspond to the time inversion. Yeah. So it is very easy. So when there is no time inversion, the solution is simple. Oh, we are coming very soon to the conclusion. So the first case is A equal D, which means that B equal C. So the only <clears throat> the only Now, the, the only uh, equation which remains now is, for example, this equation or, or this one, it doesn't matter. So, for instance, a square minus b square equal 1. Okay, when an intelligent person sees such an equation with plus sign, then the solution is obvious. One of these numbers is cosine and the other sine. And when the, the same intelligent person sees the equation with minus sign, then the solution is what? Hyperbolic cosine. And of course, now, this must be a cosine because a hyperbolic cosine is always positive. Therefore, there, sine and cosine were symmetric in a sense because after uh, rotation by uh, p, half of p, cosine becomes sine and so on and so on. Here, there is no such a symmetry. There is no symmetry between time and uh, space. Therefore, 
A is equal hyperbolic cosine of some parameter let me call lambda and B is equal uh, hyperbolic sine of the same parameter and then this also is equal to D and this also is equal to C therefore symbolically we may write down this uh, transformation in the following way that tau x is equal lambda sorry sorry hyperbolic sine of lambda hyperbolic cosine of lambda and this metric acts no no these are new coordinates we obtain new coordinates from old ones by this transformation which may be called a hyperbolic rotation previously this parameter phi could be restricted to z from 0 to the interval from 0 to, to, to pi because these functions trigonometric functions are periodic therefore we don't get anything new if we <laughs> if we go beyond 2 pi. Yeah? Here it is no longer true. Lambda now uh, covers the entire a a a real axis from minus to plus infinity. If we take into account also the second case a equal minus d therefore we will have also uh, transformations which we don't like very much namely the inversion of time for us the people the mortal being the inversion of time is impossible to access and so on okay what is the difference first difference between euclidean and pseudo-Euclidean case is first of all instead of trigonometric we have hyperbolic functions and then here there is change of sign whereas here no it is good to understand uh, I have oh, yes I have to I have to finish now so let me make only uh, it turns out that these transformations are simply Lorentz transformations. We will, we will uh, find this interpretation uh, next week, and moreover, what is important, we will find the interpretation of this parameter lambda in terms of the, uh, uh, the relative velocity between the two observers and so on and so on. So it, when I was a very young person at the university, I always hated to memorize formulae. I always tried to... I was... I claim that I am always able, if I understand the thing, I don't need to remember formula because I will derive uh, myself this formula. And therefore, the formula for 
Lorenz transformations were terrible for me because I was never able whether we put one minus v square over c or one plus and somewhere we divide by c somewhere divide by c square and this was a mass. In this form I remember uh, nowadays I am also able to reproduce the physical version of, of so we will reproduce it. But I believe that this is the very original version of Lorentz transformation. And we'll discuss this next time. Thank you very much.